Welcome to Unapologetically Sensitive, where you can learn, relate, laugh, and maybe even live a bolder, brighter life. I'm your host, Patricia Young. This is a weekly podcast where we explore the strengths we have because of our sensitivity and some of the challenges it poses as well. The information in this podcast is not a substitute for help from a licensed mental health professional. Hey there. To the creatives, healers, sensitives, and deep thinkers, how the heck are you? This is a, it's an amazing episode. It's longer than usual. Jen and I started talking about holding things lightly and how do you make these shifts? And then we start talking about the wounds that we have. If you feel like you're too much or you've got rigidity and inflexibility and high expectations, expecting people to show up for you in a way that they can't. And then at the end, there's this beautiful moment. I I don't want to say too much about it, but Jen and I talk about something that happened recently between us and how I have this gremlin, but there's a counter to my gremlin that I don't even know how to communicate and I really don't want to say too much, but it's just a beautiful moment. And then when we finished recording, we talked a little bit more about it and it just feels like this beautiful glimmer of intimacy. I get tearful when I talk about my gremlin and then Jen starts crying and there's a few, I don't know, 20 seconds of silence while she's just gathering her thoughts. I, I, I'm just so grateful. I'm so, so grateful. There's also, if you listen to last week's episode, there's an update on the infection in my foot. Mm. <laughs> I'm just hanging in there. I'm fine. I'm safe. It's nothing that's dangerous. It's just an incredible annoyance. And I've been incredibly supported. This is just a beautiful episode. I think you're going to love it. There is so much in here that is relatable. And now on to the show. Hey, Jen. (laughs) Hi, my dear. You're in quite a, a mood today. What's going on? I am in a mood today. You know, it's probably a mixture of like perimenopause, there I said it, Mm -hmm. and summertime and turning 50. And uh, yeah, I don't know. I was thinking this is probably going to be the episode that's going to go so far off the rails. We're not going to use it. I rebuke you. There's something about saying that. And then, it, of course, it's a joke because it's never happened. Mm-hmm. I think we've used every single recording we've ever made. We have. Right? Yeah. But this, I don't know. Yeah. I always, it's almost like some weird reverse security blanket for me or something. No, I understand that because for me, if there, the pressure of this, I have to do this right. It has to be okay. We have to be able to get this out. That's a lot of pressure. And for me, if I'm like, if we have to scrap it, we scrap it. Then there's no expectation and the bar is lowered and it allows me to show up really authentically. I've had to do this with rolling, taking rolling off the table or when I was doing kayak surfing that one day I'm like, I'm not going to do it today. I'm just not. And I think in order to be able to fully say yes, you have to fully be able to say no. And I think that's what this process is about. And when people don't understand it, they think that you're giving up and it's like, no, I'm just giving myself permission to show up however I show up. Yes. Yeah. A thousand percent. Yeah. I love that paradox. It is a little bit of a paradox, it is. but it works a lot for me and it's going to be working today. How about you, my dear? How are you? <sighs> <laughs> we should rename the podcast. We'll just call it like two grumpy ladies. Two grumpy women. <laughs> <laughs> the infection in my mm. foot is not healing as I would have anticipated. And I, I talked about it last week and I went to the doctor Thursday, got on new meds. On Friday, I had some not so great side effects from the meds. So I messaged the doctor. They wanted to see me, which I thought was a total waste of time. I asked my husband to go with me and I'm glad he did. They wanted me to go straight to the emergency room, which I was not happy about. And I talked to Soup Jean about this and decided it was a Friday night at 5.30. And I'm like, I am not going to sit in an emergency room all night. So because I wake up in the middle of Friday night. Yeah. <laughs> Hmm. Uh, and with an emergency room full of sick people, which I'm there for my foot. I'm not sick and I don't want to catch anything. So I, because I wake in the middle of the night, I just decided I got everything ready that I needed. And when I woke up in the middle of the night, I got up and got dressed and went to the ER at 1231 in the morning and was there till 530. They did a CT scan. They looked at my foot. 
they gave me a new antibiotic if I needed one. I decided to stick with the one that I had. And then I got relief a couple for like a day and my foot's hurting again. And so I'm just feeling Mm -hmm. frustrated and not moving is starting to get to me. The first week I was like, okay, I can deal with this. And then with the setback starting last Thursday, I'm feeling grumpy and my body needs the movement. My soul needs the movement. And I find that (laughs) I'm irritable and I just don't have that resiliency. And I have to say, people have been so sweet. I have a swimming group and they played, oh, they they swam on Saturday. And one of them texted me, we're outside your house. And this is the morning I get back from the ER. And so I went out there, how are you? I just got back from the ER. We're coming in. You know, people have been calling me and asking if they can stop by, if they can bring me things. I mean, people have been incredibly sweet. Pat, who I paddle with, (laughs) he's, you know, texted me twice. We've had a phone call. He sent me a picture of a big sea lion. He says, the boy misses you. You know, so I'm feeling incredibly loved and cared for and supported. And it's just challenging. And I need to either go back to the doctor or figure it out. I've been taking pictures of my foot compulsively twice a day comparing is it looking better is it not looking better and i think my body is just slow to heal so it's been hard (laughs) and Mm. my husband's wearing a heart monitor for two weeks and yesterday my son and and his girlfriend's brother are here and they decided to go to the pool and then steve realized that he couldn't go to the pool because he can't get the heart monitor wet and my compassionate response was (laughs) "Uh (laughs) aha You're grounded with me over here. I know. And he can't go to the gym while he's got this on. So again, I I feel like Uh I'm not alone. (laughs) (laughs) I mean, we laughed about it. He didn't feel hurt. And he came in to say, are you going to be okay if we go? Because, you know, he's Uh being sensitive and caring. But I think, you know, I share this stuff with you because this is what happens in real life. And there is a part of me that's just mad. And like, I'm kind of glad that he's grounded, too. And we can laugh about it. And it's not a mean, vindictive type of thing because of the relationship that we have. But this is how you navigate difficult things with honesty and joking and part of the frustration and anger that comes up. Yeah, I love that about you guys. I mean, even just being with you, there is this sense of, you know, spaciousness and sweetness and yeah, being able to hold ourselves lightly, right? Yeah, yeah. I hope that everything goes okay for Steve with the heart monitor and you with your foot. And the fact that we can kind of poke fun a little bit at ourselves, I think is really important. Yeah. Yeah. I'm thinking, Jen, maybe we should just shift what we were going to talk about today and talk about holding things lightly, because I think that fits more with what's going on with you. And I have enough things going on that we can certainly switch to that if you want. Sure. It is your podcast, my dear. And I'm here for the ride. So Yeah, we can go in whichever direction you want to. Holding ourselves lightly. Yep. That is something. It doesn't come natural to me, actually. Really? Yeah. Yeah, it really doesn't. I'm coming from a place of having been pretty tightly wound and taking myself very seriously a lot of the time, life seriously. I actually feel like I'm still trying to break out of that. That absolutely shocks me. Because that is so not my experience of you. My experience of you is that you just kind of go with whatever goes. And I mean, this is a phrase I use for myself, but like you kind of fly by the seat of your pants and you seem to be really okay with it. So to hear you talk about being tightly wound surprises me. (laughs) Did I ever tell you the story when I learned how to knit? This is probably 14 years ago. I don't know. And I had a friend teach me And then another friend and I went to take a class together so that we could learn more techniques beyond just the basics of knitting. And it was a mitten class, right? So we were all making these nice, fuzzy, floppy mittens, right? Is what was supposed to happen. Well, if you can imagine holding a mitten up, a knitted one, right? And it would just sort of flop over nice and gently. Well, mine stood up. Mine looked like a torpedo. (laughs) It came to a point instead of being nice and rounded because I was such a tight knitter, right? And so knitting is really, it was like this externalization of really a lot of the tension in my body. Mm -hmm. And it has been so worth it. And I think really just beneficial to, when you see something external like that and then to be able to learn from it, Mm -hmm. Be like, all right, take some breaths. It's just yarn. Breathe and, and knit a little lighter and, and knit a little bit 
gentler and not quite as tightly. It really taught me a lot. So yeah, I think I'm definitely a recovering perfectionist and controlling. And Mm -hmm. this is kind of a sweet moment because I know, you know, you and I have gotten to be so, so close in the last four years, right? Five years. And I don't, I, I have a I know. very a- tent- tentative relationship with time, however long yeah. it's been. <laughs> <laughs> so let's say that puts me at 45. Like that was a lot of life beforehand, mm-hmm. right? Before we got to know each other. So yeah, looking back and there's still, I do like to joke a lot and I like to find the levity in things, but it's, it's hard one. It's it's effort. It's a little bit of effortful and it's a joyful effort. Mm. Like I, I do I do like it. It's funny when I was when I was married, yeah, I was pegged as like the humorless one. Mm. Which is interesting. Surprises some, me. You know how we I right? Yeah. Like we well, it now it does. Now to me I'm like this okay. You know, but we we receive information about ourselves from each other. And, you know, I was married for a long time. Yeah. That was definitely kind of cool to get to know myself again and discover that yes I'm actually pretty funny and fun and I've had lots of moments like that in my life I remember not even feeling my I think you and I have talked about this feeling my like athleticism until I was like nearly 30 Mm -hmm. because that just wasn't anything that was ever mirrored back to me yeah yeah so Mm -hmm. It's interesting because I know how to knit just a basic knit and purl and a single crochet stitch, and I cannot relax and get my stitches loose and even. So I totally identify with that. Obviously, everything in my life right now, I'm looking at it through the lens of my autism. And I think this is still relatable to the listener. Does this mean you're autistic? Not necessarily, but I want to start sharing more from my lens and then you see if it fits and Does it fall under neurodivergence? Does it fall under HSP? Does it fall under ADHD? We just don't know. And so I'm just going to name what's true for me. And this is more about what's identifiable to you. But I think I historically have been very rigid and inflexible and my need to have rules about things. It's this or it's that. And having very high expectations, very unrealistic expectations, lots of feelings about loyalty. And this is how I show up. And not having a lot of room for people to be human and fallible. And yeah, I think this shows up in so many aspects. I mean, even around like, how come the doctor didn't know? The first doctor said, don't soak your foot. The second doctor said, soak your foot. I'm like, how, you know, where's the rule? How come nobody knows? Mm -hmm. And so there is this internal part that I think is wired in a very rigid this or that and working really hard to, I still internally have a lot of reactions, but really practicing holding things lightly. It's funny. I mean, a little example is this morning, Soup Jean asked if I could pick up something from a neighbor that is on a free Facebook group. I said, sure, no problem. But the timing wasn't exactly right, but I trusted it would work out. And it looks like it's an apartment. So I said, is there a unit? And she's like, she didn't say a unit. I'm like, I trust it'll work out. Where I think historically I would have been like, can I have the person's number? Are you sure? Can you? And it's like, if I go and I can't find it, I can't find it. And so really taking that attitude of, I mean, that's a very small example, but just trusting that it'll work out. If not, then we'll figure it out and it's okay. Yeah, it's that that sense of playfulness and figuring out the world. I came across that slogan. It's like, what the bleep do I know? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> that's my favorite thing to say. And It's duck if I know, but it's not duck. Duck if I know. <laughs> that's right. Yeah. I wish I... I have to find some creative way to like make that into a tattoo Mm -hmm. or something. Mm -hmm. But anyway, (laughs) yeah, I mean, I find that rigidity and stuff like it started with me, right? And my own like rules with myself and I can kind of track it through my life and where it came from. And, but yeah, I think it's been a really big gift to be able to, bring in that sense. And I do think there's a playful and creative element to it, right? It's trusting that you can walk through the world and meet the people in it or the buildings in it and and just figure figure stuff out in a really open and creative way. Of course, you know, my brain's going right to Gabor Mate's four things and it's the fourth. It's like children's need for unstructured play Mm -hmm. so that it doesn't become so literally rule bound. Yeah. Right. Like 
take this ball, put it in that basket or net. Not that I have anything against sports. Those are great for certain things. But then so is, let's just mess around and find out what happens. Right. Well, I think that what goes along with this personality, I don't know how else to frame it. Personality type isn't the right word. But if you're someone who wants things to be a certain way, expects things to be a certain way, has an idea of how people should show up, my experience is there's also this belief of over-responsibility, over-functioning, who I am isn't okay. Everything I do has to be right. And if I plan and prepare everything right, then I have control over the outcome. And so if you follow that paradigm, what that would mean is then I'm responsible when I go to pick up this thing that if I can't find it, I have to figure out where it is as opposed to I went and I couldn't figure it out. So now what? To say back to Soup Gene, now what do you want to do? And I think that when we are not seen and heard for who we are, I've been talking with a number of clients really have that wound of too much and are very productive in their lives, get a lot of stuff done, but really over function and hustle for their sense of self-worth. Because when we were just being who we were, our parents, our caregivers didn't have the capacity for us to just be loud, questioning, curious, talkative children. And we got the message that how we show up fundamentally is flawed and we learn to edit ourselves and make ourselves small. But that fear of always being too much and having to figure things out and doing things right, that there's never a place to rest and relax in who we are and do we just have value and worth for being. And that over-functioning and over-responsibility, I think, ties in with that sense of control of wanting everything to work out because if we can just get everything to work out, then 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 we're on to the next thing that we're trying to overfunction and manage. Mm. There's not a place for rest in there. And knowing that who we are is okay, even if we're not doing. Yeah. There's a lot that you just said there. I mean, I do think that there's a, it kind of starts in a certain personality. I think like a high conscientiousness, you know, and then like, depending on what those early experiences are, and it's also embedded in our language, like fault finding, Mm -hmm. Right. And then that starts to warp into a real deep anxiety, you know, Mm -hmm. and if it doesn't go like, is it my fault that I didn't have the apartment number or or I should have known that? Like, how often are we like, oh, my God, I should have known that. It's like, why should you have known that if you were never, you know, exposed to something or you weren't informed or it really does break my heart because I think it's such a profound source of suffering in the world. And if we're talking about early childhood experiences, you know, so many parents, I don't think really know a lot about children and child development. Mm-hmm. And I think are so anxious, right? A lot of, and I know I have felt this as a parent, like you're parenting in a fishbowl. And somehow if you don't have control of your kids and they're like little tornadoes, <laughs> They're just these quarter baked humans (laughs) that are so not done yet. And, you know, yet as a parent, if I could have a nickel for every time I've been working with parents and it's like what we're asking these young, young children to do more times than not, we're not capable of doing it. Like talk about unrealistic expectations and that's how perfectionism and then that we're somehow flawed. And because obviously if my, the person that I love and is supposed to love me so much is like finding all of these you know, so upset Mm -hmm. even now, like, and and I'm in here. I mean, I'm included in this. I had a little mini fiasco recently with a terrible rainstorm and a window air conditioner that I hadn't put in correctly. And I'm like barking orders at my kids because there's all this water just coming in through the wall and through the window. Mm -hmm. And they're like, mom, like they would have appreciated it if I would have been a lot calmer and nicer. And yet I was hyped up and anxious, you know, and then we have a lots of good debriefing about what that was like for them, what it was like for me. Right. Oh, but the whole thing is just like, oh gosh, please, can we all just like relax and show each other some grace? And I'm really discovering that I don't know how to rest and I don't know how to really center my life around myself and, and take good care of me and make sure that I have that kind of space to air my head out. And I really need it. Right. <laughs> But with the situation with your kids, if you and your kids didn't have the relationship that you did, this is what happens. You're panicking because water's coming in and you want the water taken care of. And I'm not saying that this is what you did, but you know, you're telling your kids to hurry up or you're angry or you're telling them to do it faster, do this. 
and you don't debrief, what a child is most likely to do is mom is upset because of my behavior and I wasn't fast enough. I wasn't quick enough. You know, and if you said, don't put the towel there, I didn't know where to put the towel. And so the child makes these corrections based on your feedback of being frazzled and thinking that if they can only correct these things, the next time you will not get upset. <laughs> no chance of me not getting upset. I mean, I'm tightly wound. I told you. And it does come out and I'm like, I'm just going to be frantic right. regardless. But you figure when this starts yeah. very early in a child's life, if they spill milk or they track something in and the parent gets upset and the parent doesn't say, I'm so sorry, I'm, I'm having a hard day. You know, let's just clean it up. This is what we can do next time. Everybody does this. When that corrective information isn't there, even young children will figure I'm bad and mom got mad because I tracked something in or because I did this or I didn't pick up my clothes. As a kid, because my dad left and I was chubby and he would pick on me about my weight, I swear to you that so much of my life was about if I just lost weight, he would love me and how much of my anxiety was around learning about diets and counting calories and thinking if I lose this much, then I'm going to be this much by then. Like that became an obsession and a way to deal with the rejection. And he left because he just didn't have the capacity. It has nothing to do with me. And even if he did have an issue with my weight, that's his issue and it's not mine. But these are yeah. the ways that we internalize. And when we don't have somebody who's talking to us about it and helping us learn as children, we create these stories and these dramas about who we are and how we're not okay. And if we can just manage whatever we've been criticized about, then we will be loved and accepted. And it never happens because it wasn't about us. And this is pretty powerful stuff. And this was true for me that I could intellectually tell you that this is what happened, but I still got stuck in that feeling unworthy and doing behaviors that were hurtful to me because it's more than just an intellectual process. You've got to go in and do that deep healing, the feeling healing work in order to get what we know intellectually integrated, integrated. <laughs> yeah, those are two different things. Yeah. For sure. Like the, and if you think about it, one is, one is intellectual, right? And we are, can write dissertations on different aspects of our histories or not. Cause I know there are certain things of mine that I suspect were pre-verbal and it's really hard to get out with words. Right. And so then there's this like felt, you know, what we call a felt sense, right? right? Which is, you know, how many times have we said like, well, I know that intellectually, but I don't feel it like in my bones. <laughs> I'm just realizing it whenever I'm, often with my kids, they'll, they'll laugh and they'll, they roll their eyes at me now, but because I'm always like, you know, if I tell them that I love them, that I love you too. I'm like, no, but do you feel it in your bone? <laughs> so they're like, Mom, what are you even talking about? But it's this, that's what I'm talking about, right? Is that this, it's this felt sense and a knowingness of our own, you know, okayness, right? That one stripe in, I don't know, maybe this is relatable, maybe not, but and I don't know if it was my Catholic upbringing or what it was, but like this sense of if something bad happened to you, like somehow it was you, like you did something wrong to make it right. happen. I guess it's a version of victim blaming or something where, you know, life just becomes so scary and, uh, and that felt sense instead of just being relaxed and okay, just becomes so, so tight. Right. You know. And if you're wired to get have a big reaction, you can't prevent that. But what you can do is manage the reaction. And if you have parents or caregivers that understand that, then they can help you. I've seen you do that with your kids, that your kid will have a big reaction and you're there for them allowing it. And then it allows them to move through it. Before I forget, if what I said about blaming yourself as a child resonates for you, the book Drama of the Gifted Child by Alice Miller is a great book and you can listen to it free on YouTube. There's a audio version of it. The intro is really long. It's like 17 minutes. So, or the preface or whatever it is, because it's been rewritten a couple of times, but it's a book I would highly recommend if you're very self-critical, you apologize all the time, you feel like there's something wrong with you. This is kind of where it comes from because kids don't know that their parents are struggling and aren't meeting their needs. And the way that kids survive is they make it all about themselves. It's kids are self-focus because that's where their developmental stage is. Yeah. You know, it's interesting too, because a lot of the things that, that we internalize as kids, we, 
I don't know if I can say this clearly, like we, as we grow, we expect the opposite to be true. Like I, I worked with someone a long time ago who was an elder, right? And because part of some of the, I guess, pretty oppressive messages that she was getting, and a lot of us get this, like respect your elders at all costs, kind of blindly, right? Not to question, <laughs> forgetting that it's a sign of intelligence in a human to question, mm-hmm. but aside from that. And then when you're then the elder and you're not being respected, it can really cause a lot of upset, right? So if there are things that you got in a lot of quote unquote trouble for, and then you see, and in the focus was very much on fault finding. And then with other people, you're like, well, wait, this should be the other side of the coin. Like, why isn't this person, you know, either getting it or doing it for me or like, it really can tangle us, us up a lot which is why I, I like to talk about us sometimes in like almost like feral terms, right? Because there is, and I am intense. So my kids are going to be intense. Like I feel things intensely. And if I can be contained, I just like, ah! mm-hmm. <laughs> and then help them understand what that's about, you know, and even for themselves, like, it's not like we dial up this stuff. I didn't dial up, you know what? It'd be a great idea to freak out while the <laughs> flood is happening in my not. bedroom. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's not. It it just ha- it just happens, and so to being able to show our ourselves that grace too. Yeah, and in our family, we just we talk about being blamers. Like I'm a blamer, my son's a blamer, and oftentimes I'll make my son repeat after me. It's like I'm a blamer. I'm a blamer. Like my mother. Like my mother. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm gonna borrow. That. And I think bringing levity to ab- about it again, like it's there and it's in the room, and that's how we diffuse the energy. And like I am a blamer. That's the first place that my head goes when I can't find some of the. You know, my husband. I've been talking is, and especially I've been doing a bunch of assessments and and writing for. I'm getting a formal autism diagnosis. Self diagnosis is totally valid, and I just have a need for a formal diagnosis. And you know, Steve and I were talking because I think because I've been married for so long and I have my own business, my lifestyle, I don't get triggered and activated. So when I'm answering a lot of assessment questions, I really have to think back to how things were in the past. But he says, I just don't touch your stuff. I know not to touch your stuff. And my motto is don't touch my stuff. Don't move my stuff. That's really a big one for me because I think it's probably my ADHD that I need to see things as reminders and I need to put things in the same place so I know where things are. And so if you move my stuff or think you're cleaning up and helping me, it bugs me or Steve will throw receipts out and then I need the receipt and I can't find it or I want to check the price on something that like, just don't touch my stuff, don't move my stuff. And I'm a blamer. And we hold this very lightly because it's just how it is. And it's kind of a joke in our family. So it's not really a big thing. But I think if we didn't joke about it or talk about it, I think there would be a ton of tension and I would get really angry when this happened, which I did a lot in the past. I love that. This, the bringing it and naming it in the room. I know around my house, what that often looks like is just trying to create some awareness and I would say wisdom around like what's human nature. Mm-hmm. And sometimes if you if you overhear some of our discussions, it almost sounds like we're a family of aliens mm-hmm. that are talking about, well, that's just customary or, you know, that's in the culture. That's that's something humans do. And I think it's so helpful. Yeah. You know, to to just uh ease up a little bit. Like let ourselves off the hook. Yeah. Yeah. And then at the same time take accountability. There's the paradox, right? right. Like it's funny how both can be true. And and I think what I hear from a lot of people, and this, I guess, is the rigidity, some rigidity and some rule following too. It's like that if then that applies, like, oh, you go easy on everybody and then like, we're going to have chaos. Like everyone's just going to be easy. Nobody's going to take any accountability. And what I love so much about paradox is that both things can equally be true at the exact same time that we can ease up a bit on ourselves and take accountability. They don't cancel each other out. Yeah, no, I totally agree with you. I was going to say my son, Daniel, and his girlfriend's brother, Logan, are here. And for my birthday, Jen, you sent me a ton of fruit and sweets and cookies and a cake and all this stuff. And there's been so much that I I put a lot of it in the freezer. So when I'm ready for it, (laughs) I'll have it. But knowing that the kids were coming, I kind of tucked some of it away because like, I don't want to share it. It's my stuff. And so (laughs) I said to the kids last night, there's this and that in the freezer. I said, most of the stuff is out, but I hid some stuff. So if you find stuff that looks like it's hidden, don't eat it because now I'm hiding food. You know? 
(laughs) (laughs) And there is a thing around loss of autonomy with that, that this is stuff that you sent to me that I want when I want it. And because I'm feeling so inundated. Also, the antibiotics are like, I'm not wanting sweets and I'm not wanting greasy food. My stomach has just kind of been in uproar and I'm on my second round of antibiotics. So that's part of it. And I want this stuff, like I'm happy to share it, but I have in my mind that you can have have a good amount, but I want there to be enough left for me that when I'm ready, I want it to be there. And if you eat what I think is too much or you finish it, I'm going to be upset. And my mom made this great carrot cake for me and we had this big slice left and I just didn't want it. I told Steve to have it. So I'm not saying that I don't share food, but I'm apparently having feelings around what I feel like is mine and what I'm entitled to. And again, we just name it. Yeah. Yes. And I mean, I know (laughs) I'm feeling like being a mom and how many things I've given up. I'm sure Mm -hmm. that there's and willingly and happily, sure. you know, but I'm expecting that rubber band to snap back <laughs> at some point, like mine. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Because they're so giving, right? Yeah. And I can understand that. I mean, I've seen your boys. They, <laughs> <laughs> they look like they would need to eat a lot. Yeah. They're beautiful. Yeah. They're really <laughs> sweet. It's funny. I had something in the house last time that they finished and then they went out and replaced it. And I said, Aww. I appreciate it, but ask me because it was something that I wouldn't get again. So again, (laughs) you know, communicating. And so last night I said, hey, that thing that you got last time you were here is still there. If you want to polish it off, go ahead. And after I said that, I had a little bit of a gremlin about like, ooh, like I felt a little shame about my food stuff. And you know what? I think we all have food stuff and it's okay. And I know lots of moms that hide stuff. So here's the deal. If you you take things in the freezer and you save the vegetable bags, I don't do this, but you save the vegetable (laughs) bags and you put stuff in the vegetable bags, your kids won't find it. (laughs) It's likely to remain untouched. Oh my gosh, that is so funny. Thanks for the tip. Yeah, I have a drawer. It's funny. We call it the Heidi drawer that, you know, like I put my treats in and nobody likes my treats anyway. So it's not a secret. But I think since you sent me some of this good stuff, I I did. (laughs) I did put some stuff away. Can't always send it. I can't always send it again. No, I I have it all. (laughs) It's all hidden. (laughs) Mm. So, yeah. That was fun. That was fun to do for your birthday. That was amazing. I don't know if I talked about it, but I knew the Instacart order was coming and I came in the office, I think to do some recording or to do something. And I saw, I thought it was my mom. I saw somebody moving off the porch. I was still in my pajamas and I went to the front door and it was a guy who had left the groceries and he was walking back to his car and he's like, good morning, Patricia. (laughs) Like, hello. (laughs) He says, these are from Jen. I think he said, happy birthday. (laughs) It was because I was chatting with them. Oh, were you? <laughs> yeah. I was like, hey, I'm in Philly and my friend is in San Diego and I can't be there for her birthday. So this is what this is all about. Yeah, he was totally sweet. Oh, really okay. Nice. I didn't know that. So yeah, it was very oh, it was sweet. Funny. And then there was just all of this stuff. It was just amazing. Just amazing. It was hard to not be able to physically be I there. Know. So I thought I was okay about it until the day before and then all these things happened and ugh. But you were so gracious about allowing me to just be disappointed and to really let that part of me when you said like, well, something's coming tomorrow. I'm like, but I want you to bring it. (laughs) So how is that for you when I tell you I'm disappointed and then I push it a little bit? Because it was a little scary for me. That's the first time I really let myself really feel the disappointment and share it with the person I was disappointed with. You know, it's been such an interesting thing in our relationship. I can still feel tiny bit like, how I might have responded years ago, Mm -hmm. right? Before talking about identifying, pondering and questioning, like, you know, what am I responsible for? You know, showing myself some grace that as a human being, I'm going to disappoint others, honoring my limitations. I'm still working on like allowing myself to have needs Mm -hmm. without feeling just object humiliation about that fact. Sure. So that's some healing part. But, you know, the way you and I have done it, it's been super helpful. And I'm not so much thinking about the one with your birthday. I mean, that was hard because I, I too, was disappointed. Mm -hmm. So instead of it being like, you're there and you're disappointed and then there's this line and I'm on the other side of that line. When I heard you, it really felt like a shared disappointment. Mm Mm-hmm with a lot of grace and understanding in our contexts, you know, and I couldn't, it's, I'm just, you know, maybe when my kids are in their twenties, it'll be easier mm-hmm. for me to, to make that choice. 
You know what I'm talking mm-hmm. about. So where was I going? That one, I wouldn't say it's hard to hear because of the safety that I feel in our friendship, which, and by safety, I mean, I can show up authentically with all of my, whatever you want to call them, bruises, quirks, pain, limitations, and hands down is the safest relationship I've ever been in. Mm. And yeah, I know I really appreciate it. And of course, as I say that and celebrate that, it, there is this shadow side to that, right? Which is all of the relationships that I'm in where I don't feel safe. And now often that's not necessarily, that is not about the other person a lot of the time, especially from this core wounding place that I'm talking about. Mm-hmm. And then of course, you know, some people aren't safe. So both things can be true sure. sometimes. But that that sense of safety allows me to to be with stuff like that without it being a huge threat to my self-concept. Because mm. I think that's where defensiveness comes from, right? Defensiveness comes from, wow, I'm being, if I'm, I have high conscientiousness and I don't want to be wrong and I feel responsible and I don't want it to be fault finding. And if you were Catholic like me, like you're going straight to the bad place, you know, kind of like energy. Mm-hmm. Oof, I could, of course, defensiveness is going to kick in. Of course, there's going to be this line in the sand and I'm going to get into like, this can't be like, I have to change your mind. I can't let you have your feelings about this because of what that says about me. You know, And it's just really, you can see how intensely, quickly and complicated it can get. Mm-hmm. And so in our little crucible here of our friendship, it's a really been a beautiful place to just be like, Whew, you know, it's, it's okay to be human. It's okay to uh, just all of these things, the sense of okayness, that's really a lot of what the safety is about. Mm-hmm. And that was hard earned between us. Like, I remember the first time I got vulnerable with you and I was like <laughs> totally ugly crying and, and was like, okay, I know you're never going to want me on the podcast ever again. This was like way before we were doing it routinely. Mm-hmm. And so it's been a series of becoming vulnerable, taking the risk. And then, and then it started to get kind of interesting. I, I'm going to say interesting instead. I was going to say fun, but it's like, not that, not that it's an invitation to be a jerk and like push that envelope with you. I'm not about that at mm-hmm. all, but just be like, oh, now what's possible? Mm-hmm. And I think you and I both have experimented with this, what's possible. And then, wow, I feel a gremlin that I'm talking an awful lot, but I wanted to reflect on the more recent time, which I think was just on Sunday, mm-hmm. right? Where you were voicing, I think, I don't want to speak for you, but some disappointment. Mm-hmm. And because of how undefendedly like we're able to share things like that, it was so valuable in helping me identify the ways in which I didn't have a lot left over to give you because I hadn't given my own self anything. Mm -hmm. And that's something that I'm actively working on right now, centering myself. I need like a total rejuvenation, something or other, because I kind of started today off with, with, you know, feeling kind of grumpy and just not feeling like I have no energy. I I really should look into like what is going on with perimenopause or whatever this is Mm -hmm. because it's it's hugely affecting my life force. (sighs) So anyway, when you were telling me about that on Sunday and I'd be curious to turn it over and and hear what that was like for you, it was such a gift again, right? Because there's safety, it's information and it's said with so much love and gentleness, I guess. It, those might not be the exact right words that it's safe for me to look at it. And not only is it not a threat to my self concept, it's like, oh, maybe this is something that can, can inform that or I can get curious about and learn from. I'm feeling tearful, Aww. which I'm okay with. Well, I have a gremlin because historically, I mean, I still do. I think I'm getting much better, but I've had very high and very unrealistic expectations and relationships. And even in our relationship, my gremlin is, I think it's much, much less now. But my gremlin is, how come you never come to me telling me I disappoint you? (laughs) Like, how come I'm the one that like, I'm still doing it? And I struggled on Sunday because, you know, I was in the ER Saturday morning and I was tired and I really wasn't feeling well. And you were so beautiful. You woke up in the middle of the night and texted me. I was in the ER to check on me. 
we share our locations. So, you know, when your child was in the hospital, I kept watching to see, are you home yet? And you were watching to see where I was. I mean, it's really this beautiful holding. And I just was not up to communicating on Saturday. I just felt yucky. And on Sunday, I, th- I felt much better and said, I would love to connect today. And you said, great. And then the day went by. And then that part of me is like, I know you love me. You've been here for me. How can I be upset? How can I be disappointed? And I did feel disappointed. And when you FaceTime me, I really had this thought of like, I don't think I want to pick up the phone. Like I feel taken advantage of and I want you to appreciate me. And I don't, I'm feeling afraid. I don't think I've shared this with you. So are you okay? That's no, okay. Are you okay? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And like, I don't want to be available because I want you to treasure me because I want you to value my time and I didn't feel prioritized and it's your life and you get to do whatever you want. And I don't have any control or for me to expect you to prioritize me is like, that's not my stuff. I can have feelings about it. And I did pick up the phone and I did share you and you thanked me. (laughs) You thanked me for sharing. So I'm sharing all this because I think that we can go through the whole gamut of, I don't want to, and and, and I'm hurt. And then you thank me and we had this beautiful conversation and I needed to be upset for a few minutes and then like, okay, I don't know what else to do with this. So let's move on. But again, we're just navigating what is real and happening in the moment and letting all of those parts, those hurt parts, those young parts. And then we had a really beautiful connection that you and I were talking because we were going to talk about friendship today and we took a different course. But I think it's beautiful that we get to model what's possible. I don't know how realistic it is. But I guess I'm curious, if you have relationships like Jen and I do, shoot me an email at unapologetically sensitive at gmail.com. I want to hear about it. I really feel like you and I have such a special gift in the high level of communication and trust that we have. I don't know that that's available or accessible for a lot of people. And I, I know some people that are married to therapists and they don't have this level of communication in their relationships. So I don't know. Yeah, it's, uh, thank you for sharing all of that. It is really interesting. I want to loop back over something you said. Intimacy, right? Intimacy. I'm such a nerd. I love that. So I know this about you. Like, I know this is your trope, right? And the way I see it, to me, the fact that you show up in the world with your great big heart <laughs> and that you have desires or needs or wants and that you can hold them. And I'm not going to say completely like maybe unapologetically. I don't want to put words in your mouth to your experience, but that you can share them with me. Mm -hmm. I can say that, right? Is really inspiring because what you were saying about like, why don't I do that is part of what I need to work on. Mm. Like if I could, if I could give my attachment style like its own name right now, it's really morphing into a place I don't feel like it's quite as anxious or disorganized as it was at one point in my life, but it's aloof still. Mm. And I know that now I'm going to, now it's my turn to get tearful. Mm. I've got you. So I think one of the reasons why it works is because I'm inspired by that. Mm. Like to me, that's kind of a beautiful place. Wow. I think it's one of the places where I'm guarded. So the place where I feel like I'm needy and too much is inspiring to you. And part of me is going like, I still don't really appreciate where I'm at. And, (laughs) you, you know, this is the beauty that we just get to be where we're at. And I also know that I am, incredibly vulnerable. And even though this stuff goes on for me and I have a lot of words around it, I know it's my stuff that, you know, you didn't do anything to me and it's, it's my stuff. And this is, this is just the reality. So maybe it's two crying women. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. We'll have to give a little sub, little subtitles, (laughs) at least to this episode, which I was so convinced was going to not be the one. Yeah. No, no. It's not going to get published. Yeah. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. I'm looking at the time and I'm feeling ready to wrap up, but I know this is kind of a big thing and I don't want to end it if you have more to say because you 
We just had a beautifully vulnerable moment. I just so love and appreciate you. Oh, I love and appreciate you too. You know, it is pretty magical what that safety can do and you. So just to directly appreciate you because you're holding that container for me so beautifully. And I just had a little flash of thinking about how I'm not, I guess at this point in midlife, and if you've done a lot of work and a lot of inner work, like you know these things, right? And and I'm not sure that I could have had this earlier or sooner than really the last however many years. But no, we, we should wrap up now. Um, we've gone a little long today. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, my, again, part of my, my trope with the aloofness is probably to debrief with you a little bit, but then journal and, and kind of go inside and kind of do it myself. And that's part of what I think after I figure out how to rest might be my next uh, growth chapter to challenge. But thank you. You're welcome. Had you not shared about being aloof, and I think this is really relatable to probably every single one of you listening, how many times have you talked to a partner or friend about how you are and the other person doesn't have the awareness, the insight, the courage, the vulnerability to name what their counterpart is to this? That you could have, right. you know, Jen, you could have not said anything and I would have walked away going like, yeah, how come I am the person who's always and and you created more intimacy and sharing. Well, because you have a part that's aloof and you're just not where I'm at. And we, I would say, I don't know, I'd love your your thought, probably 90, 95% of the time we have partners and friends that don't have that awareness or ability to be vulnerable and to risk to share what their part is. It's counter to our part. And so it continues that narrative. And I, I hate to say it, I really have this belief or this thought that that too muchness for me, I don't know that it's ever going to go away. I think it's at one point it was probably an eight or a nine where 10 is over the top. And it, it probably runs maybe around a two or a three now. It bumps up and down where it's just, it's kind of a low buzzing in the background. And sometimes it goes away and sometimes it comes back and it's very manageable where when it was running really high, I didn't want to even name it because I was sure that people would go like, oh my God, you are so much and this is it. You know, I think people have that fear of if I name it, then that's going to be the end of things. And so even though I struggle with it or it's still present for me, it's gotten so much more manageable. Yeah. Yes. You know, it's funny in IFS, and I know we have to go, but there's this, it's really, it's funny, Bruce Cersei will say, it's like, almost like inner in inner physics. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so we often have parts that get polarized with other parts and they're in this seesaw type of relationship mm-hmm. and they do kind of fit together. And when we are in a relational, you know, when there's a relational field between two people often like, so I'll have a part that may be polarized with your part. Mm-hmm. Right. And so if we can kind of get them ah, to see each other mm-hmm. <laughs> and, if we know this about human beings and human nature, then we can really look for it and not be threatened by it. Yeah. Right. And be curious about it. Yeah. So I, again, I know I'm, I talk about IFS a lot, but it just has so much to offer. Yeah. Well, I'm thinking of a relationship that I have. And if I brought this part to that relationship, that person's part feels criticized and we have not been able to move past it. And so I just don't bring any, any, of my feelings about what happens in the relationship and how I'm feeling that are anything other than positive. I just don't bring them to the relationship because yeah, it's an impasse. Well, I mean, and it's painful, yeah. right? It, it can be very, it can be very difficult. So I can understand that. And I think, you know, if we were to operationalize, like, what do I mean by safety mm-hmm. in our relationship? It is this sense of like curiosity and okayness and confidence in that even if it's painful or it brings up something that's like, what? <laughs> that it doesn't need to immediately respond with defensiveness is the only tool. We have other tools at our disposal, such as curiosity, compassion, inquiry. Yeah. And making room for all the parts. Like you and I have both said, like, I'm here for all of it. I'm, I'm just in, I'm yeah. here for all of it. Yeah. And, you know, we can't necessarily be here for all of it for everybody, Mm -mm. (laughs) Mm -mm. you know, so not everyone is going to be that there's layers of intimacy. Yeah. So, yeah, we're going to keep talking if we don't just pull the plug on this. I know. All right. (laughs) I love you.
I want to bring I, I want to bring my knitting to Philly when I come out to see you in October, and I want to practice, practice, practice. Oh yeah, that'd be awesome. Yeah. I would love that. All right, we will knit. All right, <laughs> love you, sweet friend. Love you too, my dear. Bye. Bye. So, how was that for you? Was that incredibly touching? I just feel so blessed to not only be in a relationship with Jen but to be able to share so transparently what goes on between us. I just, she's such a gift. Being able to share it with y'all feels like a gift. I hope that it touches your heart and your soul and shows you what's possible. And really, I would love to hear, shoot me an email if you're in my closed Facebook group. Tell me about your relationships. Do y'all have relationships where you really can show up authentically and be met? in a way that just feels really held. I'm just curious to know how possible this is for lots of people. Anyways, if you're interested in working with Jen, you can reach out to her at jen at heartfulnessconsulting.com. If you're interested in working with me, I love sending people to my website, unapologeticallysensitive.com. If any of the things that we talked about today are things that you struggle with, I also, I don't talk about this very much, but I have a handful of therapists as clients. I love working with therapists. I'm Very, 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 very slowly updating my website. (laughs) And I'm going to put something on there that I do work with therapists and love working with therapists. But if you're struggling with things, I mean, I think just being human means we're going to struggle. And if you want to learn how to manage things a little bit better, get some tools, get some support, learn how to thrive, I would love to be able to help you. And I know Jen would too. I think that's all I have. Remember sensitivity is nothing to apologize for. It's how your brain is wired. You have a right to show up in the world feeling like too much, feeling needy, wanting connection, not wanting connection. It's okay if people don't like you. It's okay if people don't understand you, if they don't get you. It's okay if you ask questions. It's okay if you're pedantic. (laughs) It's okay if you don't know what you're feeling or if you feel too much or you feel everything. However you show up in the world is fine. If you're hustling for your sense of value and self-worth and you really don't believe that you just have value just for the sake of being you, that's okay too. That all parts of you are welcome. The parts of you that feel hurt and angry and rejected and upset and frustrated, all parts are okay. I think that's all I have. Have a blessed day.